Welcome to Game Storming. This is our monthly segment where we get with one of the Uber game designers that we know, Jonathan. How do you say your last name? Lystico. Lystico. I was going to say Let's Go, but that wasn't right. Well, that would be appropriate for gaming. Like, let's go play let's a board play. game. So, no, he, takes us, he takes us on a journey each week to understand the deeper fundamentals of the games we're designing, the games we love, and how, as game designers, we can use that to make awesome products. Yep. So, so what do we have on board today? All right, so you remember last week, I talked about my favorite party game, Time Stop. Yeah. Oh, that was fun. And I mentioned that it was a commercialization of a folk game called Celebrities. Yeah. yeah. Right, so typically each week I talk about uh, how you can take games, deconstruct them, and make better games. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, we're not gonna talk about that today. Oh no. Instead, we're talking about folk games. Yay! Woohoo! When you so, see folk games, I think of those like banjo people on the patio. So, all right. <laughs> What is a folk game, right? Apparently it's a banjo on a patio. Yeah, so banjo folk people. Art and folk music. Folk music is music that arises spontaneously from the people, right? Mm -hmm. And there is no like one particular creator of that piece of art, unlike, say, a symphony. Oh, that's right. I'm not talking to you because you don't like Helena Bonham Carter. So I'm only going to talk to Chris Rachel. Oh, good. Yay. You know what, Dan? I'm just going to walk this way. <laughs> Mac hater. <laughs> so tell me more about folk games. All right. So folk game, right? So folk art, what you've got is mm -hmm. you've got art that arises spontaneously from people. Folk stories are stories that arise spontaneously from people. Folk games are games that have no specific creator, but instead arise spontaneously from a people or a culture, right? Okay. So there's a few different types of folk games that you can go through. One of the most common types, or ones that we're all familiar with, are children's games. Yeah. So for example, children's games like Tag or Blind mm -hmm. Moon's Bluff or Red Rover or Marbles. Okay. Right? These are fascinating in that First off, they're passed along through oral tradition, right? Yeah. Kids tell each other about them on the playground. Hey, here's how you play this game, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that's fascinating about them, though, is that many of them are very enduring. They don't undergo the same kind of transformative genesis that many other types of folk game that we'll be talking about in a moment go through. Okay. For example, did you know that children in ancient Greece played marbles and tag? Really? And they played it pretty much exactly the same way we play it now. I did not know that. So there you go. Children's games, an interesting piece of folk game. Oh, there's another reason why I'm talking about folk games, actually, because okay. I lied when I said that I'm not actually talking about game design. Folk games are a great source for you to build a basis from a game off of, oh. right? Uh, among other things, first off, everybody knows them, so you have a common ground when you say, hey, this is my game. It's just like marbles, except it's collectible, right? That makes a lot of sense, because people are constantly describing a game as it's just like X, but Y. Precisely. The other thing is that, uh, they're in the public domain, so yeah, you yeah. have a lot of, uh, you don't have people coming at you and saying, hey, you stole this idea from my game. Mm -hmm. So children's games, the thing I find fascinating about them is that they really embody the oral tradition of the folk culture, right? Second type of game, uh, the classic game. So, mm -hmm. you know, name a game. Um, Monopoly, that type of classic game? All right, or do so you mean? Monopoly, right? Monopoly has the same kind of rights for it to feel, but consider things like chess or checkers or okay. Go or yeah, backgammon yeah. or Chinese checkers. Okay. Although I bet you could probably find an author for the Chinese chess. Anything like along those lines that you can find five of in one at Target. Exactly. That kind of stuff. Those are the kind of classic games. And now a fascinating thing about this is that in folk art and folk music, right, they tend to be kind of unstructured. Mm -hmm. And children's games, they don't require a lot of components, right? Mm -hmm. For a children's game, you've just got people in a broad space. Maybe you've got a few some goals chalk a lot or of some time. chalk or something like that, right? Whereas a classic game like chess or checkers, you need a very specific board, right? Mm -hmm. You've got this component, and it doesn't tend to change very much. And this brings us to what I was talking about with like these children's games, tag and marbles, they don't change a lot. And chess and checkers, right? Those games don't change a lot, but you end up with a lot of variants. People mm -hmm. make three-person checkers or four-player checkers. Or, or the Star Trek chess that's on three levels. Exactly. And this is part of why I think it makes folk games fascinating. Because what they do is they create a culture for individuals. They say, hey, I like this game, but I want to build off of it. I think mm -hmm. this is where you get a lot of spontaneous game design genesis, right? Okay. People say, I've got this game. I know about this game. I can make up rules for this game, which is one of the reasons why I like doing this segment, mm -hmm. to help give people some game design concepts. So, classic games. Right. Uh, card games. Now, this is another fascinating. You mean traditional deck of cards, not necessarily people coming up with Uno or with any of the card games these ah, days? All right. So, let's talk about that for a moment. So you've got things like poker and pinochle and yeah. spades and hearts and stuff like Everything that, right? Everything you can do with a traditional deck. All right, and then you said, however, Uno, right? Uh-huh. Let's take a moment and deconstruct Uno. Oh my gosh. Is we Uno a traditional game of? All right, so what do you have? You have the numbers one through nine, uh -huh. right? And then you've got the skip, the draw two, the reverse, 
which could be the jack, queen, and king. I am, I'm about to die of embarrassment you've that I never thought of this zero, before. Which is the 10. And then you've got two wild draw fours, which are special cards. Hey, wow. how many jokers come in a standard deck of cards? Woohoo! Deconstruction for the win! You this is why we have Jonathan on this, because he pays, pays attention to these details. And actually, oh, it's a shame. It's coming up in two. But the point about this is that the card games, as a social or a folk game, right? Mm -hmm. The fascinating thing about it is that what happened is somebody, well, really, the tarot deck then turned into the standard Magic deck the of Gathering cards. Magic Gathering deck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, turned into the standard deck of cards. But then you have this platform. And people just built all these different crazy mm -hmm. games off of this one incredibly versatile, incredibly portable platform. Mm -hmm. Fascinating stuff going on there. Next, parlor games. So parlor games. Mm -hmm. These are very interesting. It's like children's games for grown-ups, right? Yeah. So for example, charades or celebrities, AKA Time's Up, right? Yeah. What you've got is you've got people, they were bored, they didn't have TV, they didn't have mm -hmm. radio. You'd have people, you know, maybe play a piece of music on an instrument. But then people were like, hey, I know this great game. What was the proto version of something like Werewolf or Mafia? Because I'm sure that that was based on a folk game. So Werewolf and Mafia, to my best of knowledge, is that they started like kind of spontaneously from like college campuses, mm -hmm. MIT. I that guess just because thing. it's so simple to explain and you don't really need a deck, I assumed that that had an older history that someone like, oh hey, we can copyright that. And to my knowledge, I mean, you've got some early parlor games that have kind of a mystery kind of component, mm -hmm. but they're never as viscerally violent okay. as Mafia slash Werewolf. Uh, and again, I think that's a great example of a modern folk game. Mm -hmm. People are like, well, I think it started in Cambridge, or I yeah. think I started at MIT, right? But nobody really knows. And again, you have this uh, immense diversity, yeah. right? And this brings up another fascinating thing about folk culture, art, music, and games, which mm -hmm. is that you often have regionalizations yeah. of games, which, let's segue into the next one, social and drinking games, uh -huh. right? So social and drinking games, absolutely. You've got this fantastic amount of kind of regionalization. If you go to A&M, mm -hmm. uh, I know that there's, you know, uh, drinking games that are only particular to that region. I used to come from Penn State, and they play beer pong and beer die in a very specific way there. But the one that I wanted to mention is Mao. Have you ever heard of the card game Mao? I have not. All right, so the very first rule of the game of Mao is that you don't talk about the rules to Mao. <laughs> Mao is the fight club of social games. However, I'm going to go ahead and break a cardinal rule. No. I'm a bad monkey. Mao is Uno. Oh, OK. But you have to figure out that it's Uno by playing it? And then here's the other thing, though, is that every group has its own little regionalizations, right? Mm -hmm. So they've got these quirky ass rules. And uh, so even if you know how to play Mao, you don't know how to play Mao. Or if you know how to play Mao in the East Coast and you try to play it with people from Austin, mm -hmm. you're going to get confused and mess up. OK. So very last one I want to talk about is surrealist games. OK, that sounds terrible. Go on. All right. So there was the surrealist movement in France, right? Uh-huh. And you had, I think it was like Duchamp and people like that, right? Duchamp, Dali. Yeah. I can't remember all the different surrealists. Mm -hmm. Anyway, what they did is they said one of the big premises of the surrealist movement was art should be made by all, mm -hmm. right? And to promote that, they made up games. So I'm cheating a little bit, because these aren't really folk games. Yeah. Because we actually But they tried to make them into folk games? Well. They act like folk games because okay. they're conveyed pretty much through an oral tradition. People are like, hey, let's play Exquisite Corpse. I'll talk about it later. Uh, but the thing about a folk game is you can't point at a creator. Yeah. You can't say, hey, this is when it was created. This is its genesis, right? Mm -hmm. But you can say, oh, they took really good notes at least Salon, and <laughs> this is the first time they played Exquisite Corpse, and these were the results of their poetry. And this so kind what of is thing. Exquisite Corpse? Uh, so Exquisite Corpse is you take a sheet of paper, mm -hmm. with the top of it, someone writes the title to a poem. Okay. They fold it over so you can't see that title, and at the next line they write a one-word prompt for what they said. And from that prompt, you would then write the first line of the poem. You fold it over, you write a little prompt for okay. the next person. And so as a group, we write poetry, and you do it for about maybe eight to 12 lines, you get amazingly good poetry. Really? Because I, I remember playing something very similar as a girl in uh, elementary school, where you'd be passing things along. You'd write one sentence. They could only see that one sentence folded over, and then you'd read the whole thing. But we weren't trying to make poetry. We were just trying to make uh, Mad Libs, essentially. And here is how you get the nature of a folk game, right? You have the genesis over here. It could be convergent evolution mm -hmm. or parallel evolution. And book, this thing appears. So for any of you budding game designers out there, what can you take from this and apply towards building your games to make them better? Well, my basic recommendation here is to take a structure and run off of that. 
I'm actually going to wrap up because I've almost gone over time. Oh, that's fine. But go ahead and give people a quick idea of what they can do if they want to use some of this towards building a game. Uh, so really, one of the things, take a look at Time's Up and how it took celebrities, research celebrities, research Time's Up, take a look at those two and see how you can take a thing and commercialize it and make it more acceptable and appealing to the public. All right, come back next time for more game storming. You're going to have a wealth of knowledge right here.